listening to the Getting Salty Experience podcast. <laughs> oh no! It's hello, Atlantis! Hi, dude. I remember and that guy. We go, <laughs> Lord Lindsay Young. What a great guy! That guy was. Welcome Holy. back to the Getting Salty Experience podcast. <laughs> It's the only one that breaks the firehouse kitchen table. We had the kitchen table going on here in the pre-show. We were pummeling Mike into submission <laughs> right before the show. We had the kitchen table Who going on daddy? right here. And, uh, <laughs> Sorry. I slid that right in there. Sorry. So welcome back. Said. Welcome back. Welcome back. We got a guy who got on 1962. I love these guys. 84 man. years old. God bless Shop you. Shop is a tack for crying out loud. I was going to tell him we got to get him on here soon. You know what I mean? You know, mm. Is he still married? TikTok, TikTok. I'll hook him up with my mother. She's gonna be eighty-five. She's a cougar. <laughs> oh, hey, he's he's ready to go. I think. I, I <laughs> yesterday. <He's ready. laughs> Ellie. And yes, yes. Hold on. Yeah, we'll hook him up For with the Ellie. First time we found a guy who actually worked with my father in Seventeen Engine, bro. I've been striking out every single time you get a guy on. Like, nope, nope. You were nope. starting to think. The men were, we were starting, starting to talk, Coops. You we know, were starting to talk like there was something wrong with me, right? Like. <laughs> Maybe had the numbers backwards. I don't know what was going on. We, we were this. dealing with the old every time he asked somebody. <laughs> a little too long, guys. You got to put my oh, time dang it. But the cap, yes. the captain did. He did, uh, he did remember, remember, he remember him. where my father transferred to. He remembered the whole nine yards. <laughs> so we'll talk to him about it. We will. Oh, hey, Mike. I don't know what Mike's doing in the. <laughs> Hi, Mike. He wasn't naked. Mike, thank yeah. Thank <laughs> you imagine that. Thank God. Thank God. Yeah, oh, maybe he was man. watching a cop show and you know <laughs> something like that going on. I don't know what's going on. That's what it sounded like. It was quick. But anyway, I got uh I just finished locking up all the silverware because I got Gonzo and Jose coming up uh to stay with me over the weekend. So I had to secure all the valuables, you know. We got the <laughs> Puerto Ricans coming up here. I don't want anything to go whoa, missing. Whoa, whoa, I don't whoa. want anything to go missing, you know. <laughs> Uh, He's in case you for sound case, effects now. Look, here we no, go. In case, here we go. Oh, hey. I don't know. Oh, yeah. Unless you're hurt. I'm only a little bit of uh, Spanish. Yeah. <laughs> what side are you? The side that steals all the jewelry or what side? <laughs> you know, if it's free, it's for me. You know, it's a yeah. firefighter model. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> look, Bill was on fire tonight. Are they here uh, legally? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> you have to come, check his papers. Uh, going to get them. The papers. Yeah. The papers. Going to get the papers. <laughs> all right. Listen, we got to get our guest in here. Um, so let's do. We got a couple of commercials. We got new sponsors tonight. It's all exciting stuff. It's good stuff. Let's get right into it. All right, here we go. Armor Tough. Armor Tough interlocking floor tiles are the best choice to replace new or aging, stained or cracked concrete or epoxy floors. Here's why Armor Tough tiles come with a lifetime warranty and are usually installed in one or two days, depending on the size of your station, with virtually no disruption in daily operation. Armor Tough interlocking tiles are guaranteed from chipping, cracking, peeling, breaking, or staining. Once installed, the tiles are non skid and non slip and meet the ADA standards for the friction coefficient. The tiles are stain resistant and impervious to any chemicals or volatiles that are used in the fire service. Once installed, your floor will be easy to clean with just soap and water. Install an Armor Tough tile floor in your apparatus bays, offices, training rooms, workshops, exercise rooms, kitchens, banquet halls, or any other room in your station. Call Vince today for a no-obligation quote at 908-917-7697. Why install a breakable epoxy floor that will need replacing in 5 to 10 years when you could have a floor that will last a lifetime? Drop a halligan on an Armor Tough floor and you won't see any damage. Don't try this with concrete or epoxy. Join the hundreds of career and volunteer fire departments nationwide who have chosen an Armor Tough interlocking tile floor. Armor Tough interlocking tiles are half the price of epoxy and will last a lifetime without issue. Again, call Vince today for a no obligation quote at 908 917 Seven six nine seven. Okay, yes, Vince. We're gonna see him down. Well, I'm gonna see him. Ruffy's not coming to the Jersey Shore show. I'll be down there with my family. I'll be putting the pressure heavy on Vince to fucking pick up a meal. You know what I'm saying? Because we're two yeah. in the hole, right, Ruff? We're two in the hole with Big Vince. 
He's got the um, alligator arms going on. I, don't yeah. know. I was going to give him a plug too. Those floors are great. We have. Uh, he's a great guy. I love it. I love that guy, man. Yeah. He sells a really good product too. Uh, you know what? He also sells a good product. A new sponsor. Oh yeah, here we go. It is a book that will perhaps go down as the report from Engine Company 82 of our generation. They Saved New York, written by Glenn Uston and Dan Potter, a retired New York City firefighter, explores the men and women of the FDNY and their respective journeys into the department. From everyone, from firefighters on the fire floor to those who were in positions of command, such as lieutenant, captain, and chief, and so on and so forth, this book explores their stories told through their perspectives. Each story differs, but the mission is the same, and the common theme is this those that put their lives in the line to save their fellow New Yorker, no matter the cost, no matter the situation, whenever they were in need. Get your hands on this book today. You will not regret it. Written by, once again, retired New York City firefighter Dan Potter and the concept and photography provided by the one and only Glenn Usden, a member of the Firebell Club in New York City. They saved New York, the men and women of the FDNY. If you'd like to purchase the book, you can do so at theysavedny.com. That is, again, www.theysavedny.com. Salty Apparel will soon be uh, selling that on our website as soon as Ruffy gets uh, his hands out of his pockets. Gets his hands out of his yeah. pockets. You know what I'm saying? Excellent. Good job. Excellent sponsors. Oh, yeah. Great book. I got two copies. I gave one to my mother. Uh, she was all teary eyed. She was uh, very proud of me. And she said, You know what she said? Her other son. She called you her other son. She's all right. That's my second mom. Oh. Yeah. Well, you know who's going to be my third stepdad? Uh, our next guest. I hook him up with my mother. I, don't know. <laughs> I think he's liking it. He's smiling. Little smiles back there. <laughs> he's all smiles back there. All right. all right, let's bring him in. Rook, you do it, kid. You know hey, how to go. Ready? Are you ready? Yeah, let's do this. All right, coming to the stage, Captain Joe Sesso. <laughs> what do you think, Cap? You got, you hey, got, how, uh... you, how you doing tonight, guys? We're doing great. We're, We're doing, doing well. Thank you. Thanks for coming on. Bunch of handsome you. lads. I never knew you were so handsome. You know. Wow. Uh, thank wow. you. You got to see his told mother. Me you were a bunch of ugly old. <laughs> but uh, no, I'm you can that right now. You, I'll you save can... that for later. <laughs> you, you should see my mother. Uncle oh, Joe. your mother. <laughs> I a, guess some girls watching this show. I got to be careful. You know, I can't divulge too many secrets. I hear what you're saying. A man of mystery. He's a man of mystery. That Captain <laughs> Sesso. <laughs> Oh, we got to get patriotic real quick, John. Yes, sir. Okay. Here we go. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. See a bunch go. of guys in the chat too who we're going to see on Monday. They're coming down to pay their respect to 288. Uh, Darren Phillips coming all the way from Canada. A whole bunch of guys. Uh, we'll go out Ooh. for a few drinks. And uh, the first person that comes to me and can tell me exactly what the friction coefficient is, <laughs> that round is on me, bro. So come up with whatever the friction coefficient is when you see me, and uh, you'll win a, a round of drinks. All right. All right. What? What? <laughs> All right, Cap. Well, welcome to the show. Thanks for coming on. Like I said before, uh, let's go back, back because you got on the sixties. But before you got on, let's uh, let's get a little of the old uh, what, where you grew up, a little about your childhood, what made you want to be a fireman, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, let me see. I was born in nineteen thirty nine, and I grew up to, like as a kid during the war. I heard all the war stuff on the, on the radio. I always heard about the the Japs and the Nazis and this, that, and the other thing. And I started grammar school in 45. Graduated grammar school in 53. I went to be to the uh, pre-seminary in the Brooklyn on Washington and Atlantic Avenue for two years. And then I decided that I didn't think I'd make a good priest. So uh... <laughs> he liked this too much, I think, right now. Yeah, I think, uh... <laughs> That had something to do with it. We never, we, we never know. <laughs> One's sure. man's poison. <laughs> <laughs> wow, so I didn't know that. Bronx, so I, went, out. I, I went to high school the last two years in the Bronx, St. Helena's High School. So I went two years in the Bronx there. 
I got out of high school. I had a hair up my ass. I, I couldn't go back to, I couldn't go to any more school. I was finished with it. So I hopped, uh, me and my friends bought a car. We bought a 51 Chevy station wagon, ripped out the back seats to make a camper out of it. We travel the whole United States. That is cool. Man. I worked on a ranch in the, in the Rocky Mountains. Come I, on. I worked picking peaches in Paradise Valley, Colorado. I, I, I worked in a department store in L.A. And one morning I wake up and the guy say to me, we always did everything by majority rules. It was three of us. We, I wake up. We lived in La Brea by the La Brea Tar Pits. And they said, we're joining the Marines today. And I said, screw you guys. I ain't joining the freaking Marines. What do you think? I'm crazy. You know? So, so they say, sorry, you're outvoted. You got to join Marines. So I go down to join Marines. The Marines says, well, we'd love to have you guys. But we have a quota. Down to join Marines. And the quota, you can, we'll take you for six months. And you can do six years, do weekends, and, 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 and uh, two weeks in the summer for six years. So... We didn't like that deal, so he's, we said no. So then they, he says, well, I, I got a friend in the Army. He might take you. <laughs> he was a real school guy. So he sent us down to the Army. I go down to the Army with these guys. The Army guy takes us. And so we go down for induction, and I pass my physical and everything, and I'm up there, and I, they, they, I cross the line, raise my hand. I'm looking around for my buddies. Neither one of them could get in the freaking army. I'm the only guy that didn't want to go, and them two humps, the two humps are out of there. And I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm winging my way to Fort Ord, California. I didn't know shit from Shinola about nothing, man. So I ended up in the freaking army for three Dude, years. that is hilarious. <laughs> so oh, all the guys shit. that wanted to go into the service, none of them went into the service. The, well, guy, that the didn't... one guy caught up with me, Billy Dietrich, who became a deputy chief in the job in the 6th Division. He, he was with me. He caught up with me a little while later. So I'll tell you about the army. So I, I wasn't... I was used to, you know what I mean? The brothers in school and all that stuff used to wrap us around and treat us uh, a little shabbily. But anyhow, I get these sergeants. They wake us up for Reveille about 5 o'clock in the morning. It's a, about October 15th. We're standing out there, pitch black, big black colored guy. Really, really tough, tough man. And he cursed and cursed and cursed. And he says, uh, he says, all right, all you motherfuckers. He said, I want you to look up in the sky. And we, he says, you see that light going across that sky? And we, we all looked up, and it was like a, a star. This is 1957 now. The star going across the sky very, very slowly. You know what that is? He's telling us, you know what that is? He said, that's a fucking Sputnik. I said, Sputnik? What's Sputnik? We didn't know what Sputnik was. He says, that's the motherfucking Russians, and they're going to bomb the shit out of us, and you better be ready, and you better pay attention here in this boot camp. So that's how my boot camp started out. Fucking Sputnik, you know. <coughs> so, oh, my God. It's awesome. So anyhow, I went through. I went there, and I, I went down to Fort Gordon, Georgia, and went to MP school. And then uh, they shipped my ass from Fort Gordon to uh, Germany. They sent me over to Germany. And uh, I worked in the, in the headquarters in Germany in the, in the crypto room. I had a top ultra secret clearance in this crypto room. And I had a gun. And if anybody came in, I had to shoot them. But nobody ever came in. So oh, thank God. <laughs> so you got that going for you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I don't like that job too much. So I, I uh, yeah, I'm out on that job. What, what year were you in Germany, Cap? What year was that? Fifty-eight to sixty. I was there 29, 30, 30 months. Was it still, uh, you know, from the war? It was, was all it... bombed out. It was just starting to be rebuilt. It was wow. great as holes. All the buildings were collapsed. Nobody, everybody walked or rode bicycles. There was, uh, and they they were picking up bricks off the street and piling them up and taking them places to build homes and stuff like that. They didn't have many cars. But anyhow, so I, I, I transferred to a, a, a company, a battalion, MP battalion that did patrol work rather than uh, headquarters work. And I was very fortunate. I was 18 years old. They gave me a brand new 1957 Chevy. 
Nice. And the German policeman as a partner and put me on the Autobahn as a highway patrolman. Can you imagine that? <laughs> <laughs> Stupid little kid. Uh, just out of high school about six months and I'm a highway patrolman in a brand new Chevy riding the Autobahn in Germany. <clears throat> we had a ball. All I did was scrape bodies off the freaking pavement. <laughs> They they couldn't drive over there because they didn't have cars for years. They were just getting the cars, mm -hmm. and they drove a hundred freaking fifty miles an hour. They, the motor bonds were they were bad yeah, yeah. now, but they're like that now. Terrible. Yeah. And yeah. all I used to do was crash into each other. They were killing each other left and right over there at that time. So um, that was one of my jobs. Uh, I did that for a while. Then I, I had awesome. this black lieutenant. His name was Linwood Coghill Hardman. He just got out of uh, that uh, college in D.C. Uh, that it's a very good college. There. I can't <clears> think of the name of it. But anyhow, Georgetown. They, no, no, the, 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 the Howard Howard University. Okay. Howard University. So they made me uh, made me drive him, and our job. What they had missions. Uh, the Russians had missions in Heidelberg because that was the United States headquarters. And we had missions in Berlin and in uh, with the Russian part of Berlin and in Moscow. And so these guys were nothing but spies. And they had uh, they had this big black Russian limousine with a hammer and sickle on the back of it. And we had to go out and sit in front of there where they live in the morning. And when they come out, we get me and Linwood this, he called me Sahib Joe. I don't know why he called me Sahib <laughs> Joe, but he called me Sahib Joe. And he said, All right, Sahib Joe, follow stuff. them motherfuckers. <laughs> so I follow these, these, these Russians all around, all around all day, and we would harass them. You know, every time they stopped, we'd be right there. We wouldn't let them go anywhere without being on their tail. So I did that for a while. Then they sent me to Worms, Germany, and I was up there. That was fun. Uh, I, I would, uh, the, there was along the Rhine River where the Patton and them guys crossed from Metz, Germany, only 12 years before. <clears throat> it was a really a big, big, uh, terrible battles crossing the Rhine there. They had just built the bridge, rebuilt the bridge that crossed the Rhine there, but the riverbanks were filled with, with shell holes, like the artillery shell holes and bomb holes, eight, 10 feet deep, just wow. all over the place. And they were, and the riverbanks were inherited by these great big rabbits, hares. They had tall, tall ears. And we take the Jeeps and we chase the hares that fall down through the bomb craters. <laughs> <laughs> that was a great time over there, you know. And of course, we had all the lovely fro lines. And oh, oh, nice. Yeah. Oh. You were on the face, eh? Wonderful German. German. You had a little schnitzel, is what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. They had a, they had a, <laughs> they had a, there was a wine region there. So they had big, big wine festivals all the time and beer festivals. So that was really good. Then I went back to Mannheim, Germany, and I, uh, I just was more or less a, 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 a town patrol MP. I drive around, you know. I love it. Plus tens. GIs up and bringing them home and all that stuff. That stuff like that. So I did that all that crap for about uh, two and a half years, and then uh, they put my ass on a boat, sent me back to America. I come back into it was beautiful July summer day, my dream day, beautiful. Coming down, we passed the Ambrose Lightship, and I could see the Jones Beach Water Tower. And I, you know, I, I love Jones Beach when I was a kid. I saw that. I was just so happy, man. I was like, it's like unbelievable. We pulled into the the Brooklyn Army Terminal with the ship pulled in there. And I, when I was on the ship, I ripped my name tag off, and I, I would never answer any roll calls or anything because I didn't want to do any jobs. So I would sleep on the deck uh, in that stuff for summer. I was like, so that then, yeah, that they, the time, times to get, comes to get off the ship to get discharged, they call my name and, and, and they said, where the hell you been? We haven't seen you in 10 days. We've been looking all over for you. I said, well, I don't know, I didn't hear you. I never heard you call my name. I, you know. <laughs> so anyhow, so they tell you, they tell me, all right, you got a choice. 
we give you, uh, I think it was 15 cents a mile travel to get from Brooklyn Army Terminal to your home of record. And my home of record was New York City. So they would have gave me a subway token, right? <laughs> but or, or your place of enlistment. My place of enlistment was L.A., 3,000 miles away. Nice. Yeah. Oh, look at that. Nice. So For sure. I said, I want to go back to my place of enlistment. Pay me. Pay me. That's so oh, they, man. They, they, uh, so nice. I, I, got, I, I don't know how much it was, but 3,000 times a couple of bucks. 15 cents or something. But anyhow, it was a 15 cent ride back to Flushing, and I was home. Yeah. <laughs> With a few extra shekels. Yeah. There you go. Drink him, we'll drink then money. I went to work for an Italian guy in Corona mixing cement for a couple of months. And then we had a hurricane in September. And Mixes in Flushing some Cemetery, the place was devastating, and they needed cleanup crews. So I, I went to the cemetery and got a job cleaning up after the, it was a temporary job cleaning up after the hurricane. But the, the guy there liked me, so he says, you want to stay on as a job? So I stayed there. I stayed for 13 months as a grave digger. So I dug graves there for 13 months. Then I got on the cops. I took the cops test and the fireman's test about two or three weeks apart. The cops called me in no time. So I went on the police department, and I lasted a year on them. Well, the fire department called me in June, but I turned it down because I, I, I sort of like being a cop, you know. And then, then by July, I decided, man, maybe I don't like being a cop, you know. <laughs> but, and one of the reasons was uh, I was working on the West Side in Hell's Kitchen. And, I, and it's, it's a daytime. Some guy comes up to me and says, oh, there's smoke. There's smoke in a building up there. So I, I run up and being a, you know, a cop hero, I break down the door and I run in. But I, I didn't know nothing about smoke and nothing, right? I, I'm in a neophyte with this crap. But the guy in the apartment was... Had, had filled it up with sulfur candles to kill all the roaches. The roaches, yeah, yeah. Do you ever, you ever get a feed of sulfur candles? Oh, yeah, guys? not no good. I mean, it, it was just choked me to death in two seconds. I stumbled out of an apartment, fell halfway down the stairs, and I says, oh, man, this, this sucks. The firemen come running in, boom, boom, boom. They did that in two seconds. They had it taken care of. So I, I was watching them. I seen a few flyers there when I was a cop and that. And I said, these guys are doing all right. I like that. I like their style. <clears> so uh, so I put my name back on the list. So instead of going in in June, I went in in October. I, I'd only lost about four months or five months. I don't know. Not that much. Did you, uh, did you tell them? I was doing I was, I did I tell him what? I was uh, up there doing it. You're up there doing it. <laughs> low, bro. No, it's I, I. I'm potentially keeping it low. I don't want to scare Lou. <laughs> no, that's good. <laughs> Cap, what? Uh, so that was 19. What? 62. Did you got on? 62. 62. Yeah. October 62. He got appointed. Right. Yeah. How long? Yeah. How long was Proby school then? I went to uh, like uh, December 12th. A couple of weeks, right? Eight yeah. weeks. Eight weeks. Did, you, did you have anybody weeks. on the job? Did you know anybody on the no, job? No, I didn't know anybody. No. Wow, look at that guy. That's me there. <laughs> that guy was a trim world and, traveler. Slim and trim. Ass kicking yeah. MP, bro. He knew how to do it. Yeah. That guy was picking peaches and yeah, <laughs> slaying <In> women. California. <laughs> and then he was <laughs> slaying like, women, and he was slaying. on a <laughs> For God's sake, he, he did all yeah, 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 my whole life. That, uh, well, I, I was in Proby school. I had that. Uh, um, collapse of the uh, fat factory in Maspeth. You might remember yeah, that. Yeah, oh, that's the soap factory. Soap yeah, factory. Yeah. yeah. They, they lost... Uh, the guys in 325 and... Uh, yeah, they lost... 325 well, engine. I forget and, what it is. I, I Four guys or six guys? God forgive Five me. guys, I think. Five guys? Yeah, wow. I was in probe school for that. So that, that, that... They made a big deal about that to make us learn, you know, pay attention. Well, that was... The know? fire was out and then the, the uh, yeah, marquee collapsed. Yeah, the whole thing fell down on him. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Huh. So, and so then I get out of there, and they sent me down to, to Broom Street, 18 truck in Broom Street, right at the foot of the Williamsburg Bridge. Yeah, they just and, tore uh, that building down not too many, not too long ago. Pardon me? They just tore that firehouse down not too long oh, ago. Oh, did they tear it down? Yeah, the cops were using it for a while, and then they just finally tore it down. 185 Broom Street was the address. Yeah, right at the base of the Williamsburg Bridge. Right, yeah, yep. yeah. 
Except it wasn't a towel ladder back then, guys. It was a no, we had a hook and ladder. Yep. Uh, and uh, we used to get those uh, the wonderful spare rigs, you know. Those uh, and they were they had wooden spring loaded ladders, eight, about six, yeah, 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 yeah. eighty five feet or something, maybe the, the longest. And the tractors were nineteen thirty, thirty two, thirty three tractors. If you're lucky, you got a thirty eight, nineteen thirty eight tractor. Some of them had solid rubber wheels, you know, and uh, you can never start the goddamn things. We just have to open the apparatus doors and we'd all get behind the thing. We push it. Come <laughs> push on. The, push the rig, push the rig out. The lieutenant and everybody, we put the, just the chauffeur would be in it. We push it out the doors and turn right, go down Broom Street. It was a tiniest little bit of a hill. Imperceptible, but it was enough. And it was just That's to get, we'd get it going, going, and he popped the clutch. Pop the clutch. And then we were up and running. But you couldn't shut it up. You, you can never shut it down until you got back to quarters. Could you imagine telling the guys yeah, nowadays the that story? Could you no. imagine oh, yeah. you telling guys to do rig. that? You got to push it down the block. Could you we had absolutely push it about imagine? About a half a block before we could pop the clutch. <laughs> <laughs> Cap, that was pretty and crappy they, they over there. Big fifteen foot overhangs on the, on the line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right. Yeah. And you rode the sideboards. There was no seats or anything, and the bell was in the middle. One guy rang the bell. How uh, uh, how was the neighborhood back then, Cap? It was pretty crazy, was right? Treacherous. It was a heroin capital of the city. Wow. I saw more murders than I went to fires, and I saw a lot of fires. Believe me. Yeah, they were doing we were sitting work. in front of quarters one day on Broom Street, right? You know, summer, like sitting there, horse shit, and watching the the girls go by or whatever was going by. Most uh, of them were the best nights, you know. <laughs> they were just yeah. beginning to get their, um, they were getting them implants about that time, so they thought mm, they were beautiful. Look at this broad over here, huh? <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, so she's, anyhow, got, she's got a Venus schnitzel. <laughs> There's a tenement across the street, and. Um, Later on, that tenement was used in the urban cowboy movie. They, they filmed in it, but it was occupied this day. It was still occupied. There was a guy on the first balcony to fire escape and his girlfriend, right? And it's right across the street. We're looking up at him and they're arguing. They were Spanish. They're arguing like hell in Spanish. This guy takes a machete oh, and he shit. chops her arm off at the shoulder. Oh my God! Ugh. He picks her up, and he throws her up the fire escape into Broom Street. <laughs> That's what, what it was like down there, dude. It was crazy. Dude, man, That's crazy, man. Yeah, Karen. Was, uh, that, that... <laughs> That's crazy. It's unbelievable. How? Uh, but what was the work like? How long before you caught your first job when you were there? My first job, I caught down there by uh, way down, real low reach side, down by. Uh, Sort of uh, just above the Fulton Fish Market, towards sort of by the um, Manhattan Bridge. Little, I guess it would be east of the Manhattan Bridge, an old old or ten or something. I, I didn't know what the hell I was doing. I don't know. I know there was they were dragging me around in the smoke. <laughs> um, do this, do that. I know what the hell to do. You know, put a hole here, put a hole there, break that window, do this. Well, I got into it after a while, you know. Yeah. Cap, who were some of the guys you remember? Like, who was your bosses there that you that you remember? Well. If you can remember them. Yeah, I can remember them, yeah. <laughs> Beekman, who became the August Ooh, Beekman. Gus, Gus Beekman, yeah. Gus, yeah. <coughs> he was the captain of 17 Engine, and then he became a battalion chief and came back to the battalion. Uh, Ray Gimler was the captain of 17 Engine after him. Uh, and he was a, 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 a great guy. He was a patriotic guy. He ran all the, uh, um, uh, support the guy in Vietnam parades up fifth Avenue and everything. The captain of the, uh, the truck was Walter Bourbon. Um, and we had, uh, I can name the lieutenants. I could, uh, 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 Moretta, Moretta. I remember Moretta and. There was so many lieutenants, but anyhow, was there a senior guy there that uh, kind of? There was a there was a senior guy. There was a couple of senior guys that were good in the in the in the truck and the, in the engine. There was a, 
couple of senior guys too, two Jewish guys, Maxie Rudder and David Cohen. They had been there since 19, since the war ended. We were both Holy in the war. Shit. Maxie Rudder was standing on the deck of the Missouri when they signed that, the, the, uh, the, the end of world war yeah yeah MacArthur, end of war. yeah 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 MacArthur, uh -huh. MacArthur oh. and, uh, the jacks signed the thing and and he has a he had a picture of it and then he wow. you, you could see him he was a sailor he was all, he's there so those those two guys are really really good guys or lower, lower east side jews they came from the area they knew everybody they could get anything you wanted they were great great guys and we had a uh, one guy in the in the truck uh, and he he was a uh, big Pollock guy and he was a uh, he, he didn't like he didn't like probies he didn't like young punks and he would arrest the shit out of you you know yeah and then we had other guys Manny Syracuse he was he was a senior guy he was good and Emil Pagano was another one he was great and when I when I get there as a probie they told me they gave me a, like a big five gallon can of whitewash and a, and a <clears> brush about an eight to ten inch brush and I said you got to whitewash the cellar that's that's your job, kid. You know, mm. and I, and I went down and I was whitewashing. So I, was, I mean, it's a big, huge, double firehouse, and and I was whitewashing the cellar every time I went to work. I down there, down there. One day I I got I don't know I got maybe halfway through it, and I said, "This is bullshit. I ain't doing this stuff." <laughs> so I I, I I stopped. And uh, nobody ever said anything to me. Or nothing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, see how long you're gonna there. last. Get down to sell her a white. Let's see if this kid's gonna actually go down there and do this. Yeah. Let's we'll see how long we get this guy to do this. Uh, how was that guy of... Kubler there, Cap? Huh? How was that guy Kubler? Uh, he was one of the engine guys. They were all good guys. They treated me nice. They were they were lovely guys. Seventeen engine were perfect. They were great. I loved them guys. It's a good rig, too. You hated to see when a guy left. You, th you thought you were getting abandoned, you know? Well, what are you leaving for? You know, this yeah. place is great. That is don't the feeling go, you get, Cap. You take it yeah. personal almost, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Did you work with a lot of World War II guys, Cap? Huh? You work with a lot of World War II guys? Oh, they were all World War II guys. The, that must have been tough, right? One of the MPOs of 17 Engine, Bob Scalone, he was a, a belly gunner and then be 17s and that over in Europe. Oh, shit. That guy, he was never said nothing. He just sit at the kitchen table and drink coffee and smoke cigarettes. He was someplace else. Yeah, you yeah, know? yeah, yeah. He he, I, I, he survived the war. I don't know how many missions he did, but he was a great, great guy. And he um he became a chief, you know. And I think his son was on the job too. I'm not positive, but he became a chief out on Wyckoff Street or someplace out there in Brooklyn. Hmm. Brooklyn Mikey Queens. Barone was there too, right, Cap? Uh, Mikey Barone was, yeah, he came just after me, Mikey. He was a good guy. I worked with him. Um, who else? I mean, I, I, I can name t t all them guys that you hmm. probably know. Them. Mikey Barone was great. Joey McWilliams. Joey McWilliams' son is one of the guys that was putting the flag up down at World Trade Center with that famous picture. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, 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 right. Yeah, well, his father was, me were buddies there. Um, hmm. So uh, you do almost 10 years in the truck, right? Uh, and then you I, transfer. I, I put in, yeah, well, I was there 12 years in the truck. I was only in the engine <clears> for a month or two. Because one of the, we, what happened was in 1973, I was get, supposed to get promoted. And, uh, and they called it off for two weeks. So... So now I'm supposed to get promoted November 4th. November 3rd, we went on strike. The fire department, the fire, UFA went on strike. So I was supposed to get promoted the next morning. So, uh, you know, nobody says anything. I go down there with my wife, my kids, my family, down to the 11th floor in the old municipal building. And there's a whole bunch of other people there similarly like me. And they say, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? And, and we say, we come down to get promoted. Nobody called you. Nobody told you it was uh, canceled off. Oh my God! <laughs> yeah, it was terrible. My, my, my That's parents horrible. Were there, my, you know, and all the other people. The women went crazy. They started screaming and yelling. Finally, the guy ran, and he got some big chief. I don't know who the big chief was. I don't remember. And he came out, and he he was very stern. He says, "There's no promotions today. Leave." And he kicked us all out. Kicked everybody <laughs> out of the headquarters. And and then. 
we were still on Broom Street then. <clears throat> and then right after that, I think December 6th, that was like November 4th, December 6th, we moved into Fort Pitt or on, on, uh, down there on Pitt Street. Mm. And, uh, and I, then one of the guys wanted to go to the truck, so I, I went across the floor for that time. It was only six weeks, I think, I was in the engine. I don't know. Right. But we were always in the engine. We worked, you know. Right, right, right. Mutuals across the floor all the time. Yeah. yeah. You were there during the layoffs then, too? No, I was up in the Bronx during the layoffs. Oh, okay. They, they so, came in 75, uh, July 75, they came. Oh, you got promoted January of 74, right? Right, yeah. So that's, I then I, I, I covered a little bit in Brooklyn, 9th Battalion and Brooklyn, very short. So I had a little weight. So I got 26-2, you know, truck. Wow. And uh and that was great because all of the good guys were up there. John O'Regan, who wrote Lattice Three, uh, right. Vinnie Dunn, you know. Never heard of him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, now that that rig was in, they were all in quarters with each other. 26, 26, 2, 58. Yeah, they we were all a, in. <clears throat> yeah, we had a towel ladder and they had a, a, a rear mount. Rear mount. And, uh, and 58 had the engine. And the offices there were, uh, and the engine, the engine was uh, Ray Downey. I was in the truck. Wow. Uh, well, let's see. Larry Fitzpatrick was in the truck. He got killed up in uh, Rescue in that Three fall in 1980. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm trying to think who else. There was a lot of pretty famous was guys. Donny Haid up there at that time? No, not that I know. He, he no. wasn't there at that time? Probably no. after. But the, yeah, Billy Ryan was there. He became captain of Rescue Three. Very yellow was there. He, he was a lieutenant, but he got hurt and he got out of the job. Um, George well, how, McGann, you ever hear of George McGann? I've heard of it. Yeah, I've heard of he him. He was 25 truck captain. Um, he, he there's a, a, a you, you can get a, write a book about that guy. He was such a screwball, but that's besides <laughs> the point. Good fireman, probably. <laughs> he, was, he, was, he was crazy probably. when he was a fireman, he got locked up as. On a Bronx River for catching Canadian geese and pulling their feathers out because he wanted to make a, a freaking sleeping bag. What? And the maid was on the front page of the news, fireman arrested. Oh my goodness, that's a little screwy. That's a little screwy. Yeah, a little yeah. bit. Yeah, that was way back in the sixties. So, uh, twenty-six two. How would they have? How would they divide the runs? I mean, you guys just were all in the. You same would have. Time. You would have alternate days. First up. One day we'd be first, first up, and and we go out first. First two, right? It was very busy, so it didn't really make much sense. If 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 we were first up, we'd go out to a box, and you know, ten minutes later they were out at another box. You know, it was right. just back and forth like that. But that's what it was. It was alternate days. <clears throat> you would go like that. But was it was it just busy. as busy as eighteen, or was it more? Did you feel like it was more busy up there at the time in your career? Well. There was 18 truck at the end there, down there. They were doing eight or 9,000 runs a year when I, when I finished, you know, I, yeah. I don't know. Uh, I don't know about at least, you know, around 1970, we were really way up there. Um, 26 trucks seemed to have more fires, you know, it was a bigger area. Um, and they had a lot of trouble up there because they had the, uh, the black Muslim headquarters on 116th Street there, and they were always causing problems. You know, it was right. always trouble, fires, this, that. A lot of fires up there. They've been in that same firehouse the whole time, Cap. That one right in the projects there. Is that? Well, they, they. I know that they had the old firehouses, and they they built that one, probably around, in in, in the early. <clears throat> Maybe early uh, early sixties, maybe nineteen sixty or something like that. I don't know, but it was it wasn't brand new when I was there. But it was you know relatively new. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got you. Yeah, <clears throat> fifty eight had a single house and twenty six had a single house someplace. I don't know where they were. All right, and that was a uh, it's a pretty pretty good place over there. We had a lot of. Uh, well, you must have had a lot of laughs too, because having so many guys in the, in the, you know working oh, yeah, at that time, was, right? It's crazy. It great. Oh, we had John Sonino, there, the firehouse cookbook guy, you know. Yeah, that's oh, yeah. right. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And him, 
he was always cooking, wanting to cook, 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 cook. And there was other, other guys who wanted to cook and they would fight. And then once in a while, the other guy would make a meal and, and, uh, and they'd say, hey, he's better than Sonino and Sonino would get pissed off, you know, and, he, you know, and they'd fight back and forth. It was crazy. A- Angelo uh, Pernicon was the guy. He used to fight with Angelo because Angelo liked to cook too. <laughs> would, would you say that was like the craziest time for the city, like that, that 74, 75? Was that the craziest? Oh, the Bronx was, was really when it took off. Well, the Lower East Side was absolutely insane. But Avenue A, B, C, D, 20, 28. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Truck. Alphabet City there, yeah. So, yeah, 4th Battalion was out of sight, out of sight. I used to go four or five all hands a night down there, wow. you know, all the time, all the time, you know. And they had they had these gangs, Puerto Rican gangs down there. They hated us. And uh, they, they would block, you know, set a car fire. You go down a the block, they'd block off the they throw two ADVs, one on each end of the block, block you in. Then they'd all be in the roofs. They'd be throwing, throwing shit at you. Yeah, throwing yeah. refrigerators, ash cans, tile, roof tiles. And then they used to <clears> shoot at us. They, yeah, they say, all right, everybody inside, small arms fire. You know, so we'd everybody run in the buildings. And then they'd say, all right, everybody out. It's only bricks and bottles. Get back. <laughs> could you imagine oh, bricks and bottles? Could you imagine the guys today? I mean, could yeah. you imagine? Let me run up for the safe space. Huh? <laughs> safe space. Safe space. <laughs> yeah, oh, that's, my God. I'm, uh, I'm offended. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God almighty. Give me strength. So you stayed there till they disbanded them? Oh, no, that was the, the, the bricks and bottles. That was the lower east side I was talking about, the bricks and bottles. In, in 26 truck, I stayed there. They disbanded the company. Uh, and, the, and the budget cuts, because in 75, that's when they, they were get, getting ready to lay off. And, and Beam was the mayor, and it, the city was broke as shit, you know. And so they were, they were doing away with the second sections. The 26-2, 27-2, uh, 17 17-2, yep. mm-hmm. and then all them 103 103-2, two, two, right. Them, they were doing away with them. So we, uh, like one of the last days in 26-2, we got a, a, a second or third alarm at 2nd Avenue on about 100 and, I don't know, 15th Street or something. And it was a really a, a bad fire. And... When one of the one of the apartments when it blew, you know, I don't know what happened, blew, but it blew the air conditioner out of the front window all the way across Second Avenue, through a window across the street and the tenement across the street. But anyhow, this fire was murdered, so we we put it out and everything. And you go home and you watch on news, Channel Four. There was this little blonde haired cutie. <laughs> I knew it was coming, and she was up there uh, reporting on this fire. And she accused us of setting the fire because we didn't want to get disbanded on the evening news. Can you imagine accusing us of setting the fire? Fake news back then. Look at that. Oh, <laughs> true. true. WNBC. <laughs> yeah. Forget her name. But, uh, Cap, did you know that you were getting disbanded? Did you know that it was happening oh, yeah, beforehand? Well, they, you know, there's nothing we could do about it. You know, how long beforehand do you think did you did, did they uh, tell? I don't know, two or three weeks, or not not more. Not and long. they just said, "Where do you want to go?" Or they stuck you? Somewhere? Well, they sent me. The 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 firemen pretty much got a you know they stayed in Harlem. They sent me to the tenth battalion, and I was there uh, very shortly. But here's another good story: covering in the tenth battalion, <clears throat> so I'm surplus day tour. Right, and it's winter, so I call them up the night before. You what do you want me to do? Where do you want me to go? Blah blah. blah. So you did, and they tell you go to this truck, go to that engine, and they says, well, come report to battalion headquarters because there's no vacancies. Right, you just come in and yeah, hang, hang out around. there. Yep. Right, so it's snowing like crazy. I, I drive into Manhattan, and uh, I park the car and I go in, and they said, oh, didn't they call you? I said, no, nobody called me. I said. You got to go to Coney Island. Oh. So, they're on 85th Street in Manhattan. <laughs> and I got to go to Coney Island, you know? Uh, so, so said, short drive. Crap. So I call up the guy in Coney Island. I says, hey, Lou, I says, I'm, I'm your relief. They just told me now, and I'm 
on the east side of Manhattan, 85th Street. I said, I, I don't know how long it's going to take me to get there. I'll get there as soon as I can. But God knows with the snowstorm and everything, right? Yeah, yeah. So I drive. I, I drive there. It takes me about two, two and a half hours. Right? I get to Coney Island. Guy was happy. He got overtime. So I'm sitting in the kitchen having a cup of coffee, and it's his chief. His name was Birmingham. I'm never going to get a little fat bastard. <laughs> <laughs> he comes down to the kitchen, and he says, who's a truck officer? I, I says, I am. He says, you get up right now and go. Oh, no, it was engine officer. I'm sorry. Who's the engine officer? I says, it's me. He says, you get up right now and go over to Coney Island Hospital and vacate it. Do you ever see Coney Island Hospital? No. It's Jagunda. It's like a five <laughs> square block. Jagunda. Like ten stories, and it's full of Brooklyn Jews, sick. <laughs> and it's a blizzard. And he wants me to go over there and put them all out in the front lawn and vacate it because they got nitrocellulose X-rays in the basement, and they got a big pile of nitrocellulose X-rays in the basement, and it's a very dangerous condition. You go over there and get them out. And I said to him, I said, Chief, I says. I'm not having my picture on the front page of the news tomorrow. Stupid fireman puts 400 Jews on the front lawn in a blizzard. I says, I ain't doing that. You can call a deputy, you can call a commissioner, you can call who you want, but I ain't doing it. Yeah. I've heard that before. (laughs) Yeah. So I didn't do it. (laughs) he He got all shook up and he gets the deputy to come over. And I tell, and and then the deputy says, what is you crazy? You can't do that. You know? He says, let's just go over there and see what's going on. So we took the truck and the engine. We went over there and sure and crap in the basement. There was, I mean, a, had to be 30 feet around all the whole x-rays all piled up. It was dangerous, but it was a, you know, fireproof basement and everything. And, and uh, he says, all right, charge a line, which would have done nothing because if nitrocellular goes, goes off, you can't put it out with water. It creates its own oxygen. Mm. You can't put a nitrocellulose fire out with, with water. And we all knew that, but we're, we're putting on a show. So he says, get the maintenance manager, the manager of the hospital. So this guy comes down. And he's a Jewish guy. He's got a Jewish name and everything. And so and they're, they're yelling at him and everything. And he, he, he gets me. He says, hey, he says, I'm a retired fire marshal. <laughs> I said, oh, shit. I said, well, what can we do here? So uh, I cooked up a story with him, and we went to the deputy, and I says, this is so-and-so and so-and-so, and he's retired from the job. He's a fire marshal. He knows what he's doing, and he has a vendor who he has coming to take this, and he'll just tell him to come forthwith and get rid of this stuff. And he says, uh, and I said, in the meantime, I'll sit here with a charge line until the vendor gets here and starts removing it. And so that's how we solved that problem, anyhow. But I, I didn't get my picture in the paper, anyhow. So good for you. <laughs> you know. All lifted. That's right. such a weird scenario, too, right? I mean, how often? I mean, that, that, that's such something you would never show up on. Yeah. Like, you know, you would no. never respond to something like that. I, I want to say it's got to been there for 50 years, Cap. How long were they there for? They could have been there forever. Well, I, they, they, you know, I don't know how long they were there. I, I don't know nothing. I, don't I know. want to tell you a story about this know. chief. I have it on my thing from the 4th Battalion, Dinny Shea. He came, he was uh, he was there from the from the 40s, you know, now we're in the 60s. And he was an old Irishman. He lived down in an old law tenement down there uh, by, the, by the Manhattan Bridge. But he was a tough, tough bird. And everybody in the job, all the higher ups knew him. Everybody knew him. And they knew when he said one and one and the rest fast, even the commissioner got out of bed and came. <laughs> he, would, he, he would never ever give a second alarm. He wouldn't, no matter what happened, he wouldn't, he wouldn't do it. And when we rolled down there in 17 engine, 17 engine had two pieces at that time. I don't know if your dad ever told you that, but no. they had a, a pumper and a hose wagon. And they, I mean, used to get three and two in a box, you know, three engines is two trucks in a box, and, and then plus some of them had the hose wagon. So you're getting a lot of apparatus. We're down there, and it's a, a pier burning, you know, on fire. So we're, we're all setting up, and everybody's everybody's working. Everybody's working. And uh, Shay's, Shay's driver is a guy named Noel Hart. Noel Hart ultimately became the chief of department in Gary, Indiana, years later. But anyhow, he's driving, he's driving Shay. 
Jay says to him, Noel, he says, tell him we're using one and one. <laughs> Plus, we got a boat. You got Marine Six on the boat. <laughs> so the boat's there, too. He says, tell him we're using one and one, the rest standing fast. Send another boat. <laughs> Not send us an additional truck or an additional engine. Send another freaking fireboat. Uh, <laughs> That's that was a com I think that that was probably a common thing though, right, Cap? To uh, you know, you didn't want to. You took pride in 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 using quote unquote less companies, right? You didn't oh wanna... yeah, that's 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 what he did. He wouldn't use anybody. He, right, he, right, right. Yeah, that's funny that's shit, man. Funny. <laughs> so you wind up in 27 truck after you uh, they disband. Uh... Yeah, I, I went there in May. They had the layoffs in Jan July, and I stayed there until lady too. That was another great, great spot there. That was wonderful. What was that and, like over I there? I mean, those fires. I, I I can't tell you the fires in that place. We were all over the Bronx, all over, and we had that 77 black out there. That was horrendous. Oh my, my god. god, that was just. That was the one of the. I thought the world ended that night. I swear, I was working. It was ninety eight degrees, and everything was burning. Everything was burning. Every block was on fire. Every freaking block. the Bronx was burning. Everything was everything, burning. Everything was on fire. For a guy, the guy was in the Lower East Side, right in twenty six two. That night, everything was burning. Oh, I, right? I, I mean, is that, that incredible? <laughs> we were eating chicken. I wish I had pics of it. When, we were eating chicken cacciatore when the box came on. We go out to stream on there. We were coming back, and the lights go out. You know, all the traffic lights and everything. And there was a jewelry store on the corner. We stopped at a light. There's a gang of people went up to the jewelry store. It had scissor gates on it. They grabbed the scissor gates and they pull them off and they went in, and it looked like this: in, out. <laughs> Right, there wasn't one thing left in the jewelry store. Not a, not a, even a piece of dust. They took everything out of there in about two seconds while I'm waiting for the light. So I, I call up dispatcher. I send the cops over here. Blah blah blah, and I says, well, we got a problem. We got a blackout. He says, you got to go down to this post office on Brook Avenue, someplace. There's a fire in the post office. So, so all right, so we go down to the post office, and there's a guy standing in front of the post office with a pistol, and he's a postal inspector. And it's a big crowd around them. And they went in and they were robbing the post office and they set the bags of mail on fire. Now he's sort of trying to hold them off. So we go up there and we go and we knock, knock down. It wasn't much of a fire. We knock it down fast and we tell him, can you lock this place up? Lock it up. And he says, I'm staying here. I'm going to protect it. He had a little, you know, six shot revolver. <laughs> I says, when we leave here, these guys are going to take that gun from you and shove it up your ass. <laughs> says, so you better just get, get in your, the hell out of place here. Up, get in your truck and get the hell out of here and, 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 and get out of this borough because the shit's hitting the fan here, you know? And from then we just went from one fire to another, to another, to another. Uh, and we were at a fire up on uh, Cedric Avenue, I think, and uh, we're, we're cutting the roof and, Doing the stuff, big taxpayer went around the corner. They mugged, they mugged the uh, MPO and forty six engines <laughs> operating the pumps. <laughs> Poor guys, Wild himself. West, bro. It's, it's the Wild West. <laughs> what year was this? Ten companies there. Seventy seven. Seventy seven. And they mugged them. Can you imagine that? <laughs> no, no, I can't imagine. I can't imagine. Can't imagine. What did they get from them? What did they take from him? He had his pocket. He had his wallet or something. I don't know. Maybe he didn't have much. He couldn't have fucking pumping the rig. Yeah, unbelievable. That was a crazy night, man. Ain't nobody got time for that. Somebody wants to know in the chat if you worked with the Captain Crescio. Who? John Crescio. I know him. Where did I know him from? He was in seventeen too, right, Roof? Yes, I believe yes. And then he went to Brooklyn. I think he was in Brooklyn. One, then he was one of the seven. Did he own a beer distributor? Yes, yes he did. Yeah, yeah, I knew him. He lived in this Flushing. freaking guy remembers everything. Oh my god, I can't remember what I had for breakfast this morning. This <laughs> yeah, guy I know freaking him. remembers yeah. everything. This what am I going? Where my father transferred to? You know, for, uh, fifty years ago. Man, I don't know what I'm doing right now. I did three <laughs> seconds ago. He did, Cap. He owned it. It was in uh, Maspeth or, or Elmhurst, actually, right yeah, on Grand yeah, Avenue. Right. Yeah, yeah. I, I knew him. He, I knew him in Flushing. Flushing. Yeah, we had him on the show too. It was it was great. Did you? We yeah. did. Yeah, yeah. I always wondered what happened to him. Yeah, he lives yeah. in Florida now. I think. 
He's in Florida, Florida too. Maybe we'll hook you guys up. Yeah. <laughs> is is twenty seven the one that's right off the uh, expressway there? Yeah, the Ross Bronx, Bronx Expressway, yeah. Washington Avenue. Yeah. 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 Great spot. That, was, that had to be May. I can't even imagine. And you were a boss there, like. That had to be mayhem there. I mean, absolutely. Oh, yeah, mayhem. that was a great place. Those guys were supermen. They all knew exactly what to do. I never had to give an order or nothing. I swear to God, it was it was a dream. It was a dream place to work because these guys are all salty old guys. And uh, they knew their job, you know. You had, so at that, at that you point. Did you ever hear the... of Tonto and Spink? Did you ever hear of Tonto and Spink in 27? Tonto, huh? No, there was one guy they called Tonto, and Spink was a, his, his partner. And Spink is the guy that that uh, cut his thumb off, and then he, then he had his toe transplanted. transplanted oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that was Spink. So Tonto and Spink, th those guys could do anything. I mean, they were Spink. great, great, strong, big, strong, heavy-duty guys, man. Made your job easy, right, Cap? Yeah. Oh, man. Thank God yeah. those guys. So when you got McSwiggin there, Jimmy McSwiggin, I went to high school, St. Helen, as I told you. There was about maybe 12 or 15 of us from my class that run in the fire department. Some of them were pretty, uh, pretty, you know, uh, Larry Hatton, he was a safety chief. Uh, Jimmy McSwiggin, he was a, he became a fire marshal. Stevie Hessian was a deputy. Carmine Croce was famous in, uh, in 31 truck. Um, there was a bunch of us. Walter yeah. Wilkins. Walter Wilkinson says he was your twenty-four. Well, Wally Wilkinson was my twenty-four partner. Wally. That's what he just said. Yeah, in yeah. lot of twenty-seven. Yeah, we we did we did uh, we did mutuals all the time, man. Uh, uh, I was going to tell you about what the heck was I going to tell you about? Oh, McSwiggin. McSwiggin was a big hunter. He went he hunted Africa, this blah blah blah, blah every place. But anyhow, he shoots a bear upstate, right? He brings it down. He. Cuts the head off it. He skins it, right? And he cuts the feet and the hands off it. Now he's got a torso. Puts Looks exactly like a human. Diamond. Huh? Looks like yeah. a human being. Yeah, he put he put a pair of fireman pants on it. <laughs> and he tied a rope around his ankle, and he tied the other rope around the thing on a tiller, up on the, by the tiller wheel, and he goes on a run. Now he's driving through the Bronx with this freaking... <laughs> Ape or whatever the hell it is bear. And as he comes around the corner on Park Avenue on one seven something or other, he takes his knife out and he cuts the rope and the thing rolls down towards towards the side of the road and the railroad tracks. So they don't know what happens to you. Nobody knows what happens to you. The next day in the paper, headless ape found in South Bronx. Oh, my! I heard this story. I heard that somebody story. told us. Yes, they said this. Willis Avenue someplace. Willis Avenue. How it got from 176 and Park all the way to the real South Bronx <laughs> down around Willis Avenue, we don't know who did it. I guess the neighbors did it. I so, guess. Somebody <laughs> told us that story, Cap, a while back. I don't remember who it was, but somebody yeah. told us about that. It was in the paper the next day. Yeah, yeah, it was. They And they all thought it was, they all thought it was an ape. Was a bear. Cap, I'm not I'm not kidding. If you skin if you skin a bear and you look at it and then you hang it, it looks I like know. it looks like a person. Like I know it does. It yeah. really does. It's it, like I you did, said, I, if you I took did, the hands I, off. I've been involved in that. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. <laughs> skinning people, not bears. Yeah, right? yeah, I understand. I understand. <laughs> Dude, that, so, oh, Dennis Smith said that. That's right. Thank you, Casey. Did, did um did the South Bronx remind you of Germany post World War II when you got there? It was worse. <laughs> <laughs> no, we we had guys we That's had guys incredible. come there from uh, from Israel uh, to to ride with us, uh, and they were um, government officials or something. I don't know what, <clears throat> what they were, why they were there, but they were touring that, and they said this was worse than Germany. They said when they went around Charlotte Street and all that crap, you know, all them down by thirty one truck and uh, eighty two engine fifty. 59 and 85 when they were there and they, they were aghast it was terrible it was a terrible terrible disaster that area i just see pictures but it looks like the end of the world there was 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 cra crazy things happened there you go down they call us the charlotte street you go down there's nothing but but rubble and uh those uh, ghetto weeds growing those ghetto sumac trees you know they they grow six eight feet high 
So there's a group of guys down there living, living in the rubble and living under these shade trees. They had like bench seats from uh, vans and stuff that they would sit on. So they called us down there. We go down there uh, and we go up to the guy. I say, uh, what, what's the matter? And they said, oh, Frank over there. Frank ain't doing so well. So we go over. There's a guy laying there. Uh, you know, I go over and so we say, we're going to tell you, sorry, but your pal Frank's dead. You know? And the guy Not says, available for overtime. He says, Frank's dead? And he said, yeah, he's dead. Oh. Frank owed me a dollar. <laughs> <laughs> two dollars, my two dollars. <laughs> How does that work out like that? Dude? Frank owed me a dollar. Frank owed me a dollar. <laughs> Get it, it's even to his pockets now while he's still here, oh, man. Oh, gosh. Cat, what companies did you, I, I'm not that familiar. That's about the only borough I'm not that familiar with. Who did you run in with? Are like you running in with 31 now? Like, who do you uh, run in with? 19, 1950, 40, 42, 56, 88, 38, 45, 58. Wow. Uh, so you're right in the middle of that, all that. Yeah, it was right in the middle. <clears throat> you called it the eye of the storm. We called it that. You know, we were right in the mm -hmm. middle of them all. We ran with all of them guys. Mm -hmm. All right. So now I'm going to ask you again, With now with this company, with, you know, you were on the on the Lower East Side. Yeah. You were in, you were in Harlem, and now you're you're mm -hmm. in 27. Like, where did you feel like, I know I know 77 was, was the year, but when did, where did you feel like you were doing the most work in your career at that point? I would say in the Bronx, yeah, definitely the Bronx. Yeah, we were we were always busy, you know. That's a crazy, lot of funny man. stories coming out of there. Yeah, this is a good story here. Let's uh, I'm gonna pull this pick up. Oh, that one, yeah, that was <clears throat> back in '27. That was '50 uh, '76. Uh, I, I have the date on the back. It's January something, and that's right across the street from '42 and '50. When 56 and 42 ends, were in the same court as on Monroe. And that was right across the street. It's row frames like. So we go there, and the fire's in the basement. So I, I, I know I'm in there in the basement with a guy with a can, and we're trying to knock the fire down. And the can wasn't enough. The, the thing flamed over, over the roof, you know, over the ceiling, bloom, uh, and then, then the whole place got socked down with, with, you know, black, thick, hot smoke. And so we hit the deck, and now we got to get out of there. So I'm kicking their asses to get out because I'm, I'm scared to shitless, you know. I, wanna, <laughs> I can't leave them. I got I to gotta wait for them, you know. Come on, come on, you guys. Let's go, let's go. And, and I, uh, the stairs going down. They had just started to build a closet under the cellar stairs, and it was framed out, but it didn't have any walls. I had the misfortune of crawling in that closet to try and get out of this basement, and I, and I hit the, you know, the, I, I crawled in and bang, I hit this thing, and I couldn't, I couldn't go any further. I turned to the right, I couldn't go to the right, bang, I couldn't go to the left, I couldn't see anything or anything. So now I, was, I didn't know what the hell to do. And I, I, was, I was on the verge of panic. Uh, hard to believe, but that, that's, that's true. <laughs> Anyhow, um, I, I, I said, the only way I'm going to get out of here is I got to put my nose to this ground and see if there's any, if I can see anything. So I put my face on a, on a cement and I looked, and it was about maybe three inches of, of clear, you know, no smoke. It didn't reach the floor. And I could see a light. So I, I, I got out of the closet and I crawled and I got out of there. So that was the that was the first little mishap at that job. So now, now, now the whole place is gone. Now we end up on a roof, and we're trying to cut that the back roof there and vent it for the guys going in with the line. Merrigan falls through the roof. John Merrigan falls through the roof, and um, so, so Tommy Hughes was with me from Fifty Six Truck and me, and they were in that picture, and and we're pulling him, we're pulling Merrigan out. That's me, Tommy Hughes, Merrigan. I don't know who this guy is. I don't remember. So we get him out, we get him stood up, and then me and him fall through the roof. <laughs> and we had a, we had a, we scurried out ourselves, you know, we like, you know, but uh, that, they're all happening like within 15 minutes. It's wow. just unbelievable how that shit happens, right? You know? Oh, yeah. It just goes bang. Oh, totally One totally minute you find, the next minute you're in <clears throat> yeah, deep, deep, deep trouble. Even a guy like you going through so many fires with the experience, you could be humbled or killed in a second. Oh, right? two seconds. It doesn't take two seconds. Yeah. I mean, I, 
I spent three days in the in in the North Central Bronx in, a, in intensive care, and you wouldn't believe you, you could get a feed. I was, I got a feed on the roof of an H, uh, and we almost lost the whole company because uh, we got trapped on the side of the roof, and the area was on the other side, and and the the cockloft just exploded and started caving in and we had to run and as we were running the roof was falling behind us you know going down down we were almost running uphill to get to this and the smoke was absolutely horrendous so we got i got all the guys on the area and all that stuff by the time i got on it i was finished they took me to to uh north central bronx and they put me in intensive care and they they said to me after i you know got somewhat to rejuvenate it. I said, all right, can I, I want to go, you know, I want to go home and everything. They said, no, you, you, go, you ain't going nowhere. And I said, why not? They said, well, you're clinically dead. They told me. And I said, what do you mean I'm clinically dead? And they said, well, you're, your carbon monoxide blood count is so low that you can't survive. You, you, nobody ever survives that low of, of, of uh, with that much carbon monoxide in their blood. And they said, we ain't letting you out of here until you, uh, your blood is clear. It took three days to oh, clear. Oh shit! Wow. Yeah, to clear my uh, cl clear my blood before they'd let me go. How, so, how long were you that, out? That for? was that was at noon time. You know, not at night time. You think something's gonna happen at night time? It's a nice sunny day. You know, and 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 that happened. That stuff. Cap, you know what I want to ask you, uh, Gans? Put that that picture back up for a second. Is was that a, was that tool the tool is that crowbar something you just picked up or was that no, you're that, like oh. no that was I, I bought that that was a just a nail puller nice a, you know a, yeah, a yeah I, I like it it's a carpenter's nail puller huh. I don't know if they sell them that length anymore or that that uh, type but that's what I use I yeah we still it, have man. them I use them for uh, in trench rescue we use them to pull the nails we have yeah. the same same size same one. Yeah. When it was 1970, you know, they weren't buying $400 like mini Halligans. You know what I mean? They oh, no. whatever the fuck they needed. You know what I mean? He went to the hardware store for 20 bucks. Yeah. Yeah. That, that was, was just, good. That yeah. was the office's tool. We, you know, yeah, no, I get it, man. I knew it as soon as I saw the picture. That, but that could do the job. That was a good tool. I like that tool. It's I the get, craw. The craw. I see. Yeah. Watch the was, craw. I like that one. Do we have any other pictures, guys, from 27? Uh, that's the, that was the one I, I had on. It was in that time frame. Let me see. Uh, Go back in case we missed any before we move on to Captain. Yeah, that's what I wanted to make. That was I the got hundred pictures from twenty seven. Too bad I didn't put them all on. No, that was the. Uh, I got hundreds I, I, of them. Other than the actual rig. Oh, the rig. That's the old firehouse they had. That wow. was on one hundred seventy sixth Street, and at Rescue Three went in there after they left Manhattan. And stayed there till they built up the new firehouse that they have down right down the road there. Look at them old garbage cans, Coob. Yeah. <laughs> remember how much those things weighed? Yeah. <laughs> those things sucked. I remember right, those. Now, I'm not... now you get like a plastic garbage can, right? Those things weighed like <laughs> no red exaggeration. Cobble, like 60 red pounds. Stone, bro. Yeah. There was right? another house right next to it to the left that was where 46 engine was. There were separate uh, houses. Oh, really? Mm. Oh, God. Uh, find that, bro. What was it? But they broke, they broke 47 engine that was called? It, it actually looks like two two different firehouses. They were together. 46, I think you said. Engine yeah, 46. 122 is the same way like that. 122 What truck. year? Give me a year. 1970. I'll just look at that. Let me see what I can find. 1970. That 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 was about 1974, 70, 73, that picture, I think. Let's see what I could find here. Yeah, it's got a lot of rigs. <clears throat> Cap, That's you had the same... While you were in 27, uh, you had the same bosses for the most of the time. I, you, you said you did uh, 24s with uh, Wally there, but who was the well, captain? Wally Wilkinson, we had <clears throat> Wally Wilkinson, me, Bobby Schmidt, who they, the boys nicknamed the Ayatollah because uh, he was a, he, he, <laughs> he was a tough guy on him. They called him the Ayatollah. Ayatollah Khomeini, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And we had uh, we had uh, Matty Murtaugh was the captain for a while, and then Jimmy Shuppel became the captain. And we had uh, Jimmy Roach was the captain when I went there, but he was out sick and he never worked when I was there. A guy named Roach. 
Who, uh, I wanted to ask you this before I just thought about it, not to cut you off. Who did you study with? Did you, did you have a study group that you stayed with the whole I time? Studied with, I studied with Billy Dietrich, uh, Bob Mullen, Charlie Boyce, and uh, um, Jimmy. Uh, He'll come to you. His name, Jimmy. Uh, Hexel Not Duggan. the guy from Rescue One. He's the same name as that lieutenant from Rescue One whose kid got killed in 9-11 and he just died out in Vegas. Uh, Jimmy, uh, uh, yeah, the there's, there's another story. This guy, Jimmy, I'll think of his name in a second. He, he was, uh, he comes to the 18 truck and I'm there. You know, I'm sort of like a senior guy because a couple of probies came after us. So he walks in the door and he ain't a kid. He's an old guy. So, you know, and he sort of knew his way around. So I said, talking to him, he was eight years a cop. Mm. He was in plain clothes. His partner was Serpico. Really? Oh, shit. Yeah. So I said to him, Jimmy, your partner was Serpico? And I said, yeah. And I said, well, what, he, what did he say to you about this stuff when the cops? And he says, well, what are we? He said, Serpico said to him, Jimmy, what are we going to do about this? And Jimmy said, I don't know what you're doing about it, but I'm going to the fire department. <laughs> <laughs> and he went to the fire department. I'm getting the hell out of here. And Serpico Sir, did his thing. No shit. And, and, and Jimmy, Jimmy Curran, his name was. Jimmy Curran. Oh, Jimmy Curran. Yeah, 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 yeah. But it's not the one from Rescue One, not the sort of guy that's well known. This guy grew up in the Lower East Side. He was an orphan. He grew up with his grandfather. His grandfather had a bad heart, but he was a coal deliverer. So since he was a little kid, he had to go with his grandfather and deliver bags of coal. Holy shit. And he was strong as th you could be. And he was a heavyweight professional boxer. But he was a mild man. guy. He wouldn't know he was a fighter. He had no, nothing on him. He only had six or eight heavyweight fights. But he used to spar with Rocky Marciano. Rocky Marciano, Marciano, Marciano ain't Marciano. shit. Rocky <laughs> Marciano. Yeah, Rocky Marciano, Marciano ain't he shit. He's his sparring partner. Wow. Can you imagine that? No. And I says, Jimmy, I says, what was that like sparring with him? He says, every time he hit me, it felt like a six-story building fell on me, he said. <laughs> he said, it would just go right through your bones. Every time. Into your bones, boom, right? Boom, oh. boom. Why do I bet yeah. you talk about Rocky Marciano all the time? Rocky okay, Marciano. Rocky no. Marciano yeah. ain't shit. I found this. I'm, gonna, I'm trying to see if this is, uh, is this... Back then, this is what that's I could it. find. Okay, it's kind of it's not the best picture I was been. Yeah, that's it. Can you zoom it? No, I have to. Put uh, it's it a little different... blurry. It looks yeah. a little blurry. Let's right. see if I can find another one. Different uh, kind of. I wonder, I wonder what's there now. Check that out. I've seen that, that guy Curran hit one guy once because the guy Curran got promoted as a lieutenant, and the guy thought he sh should have got promoted before him, so he was pissed off on for getting promoted before him, and he threw a pitcher of beer in his face. And Curran yeah. went, Doop. he went like this. <laughs> <laughs> and the guy went, bang. I mean, he threw about a two-inch <coughs> He couldn't have thrown it that much. He just, like, just tapped. Cap, it's always the jab, out. Cap. It's always huh? the jab. Oh, just a little <clears throat> bang, and that was the end of him. Lights Those out. Guys. I guess he won't do that again, bro. It's always the jab. Oh, so let's go to Captain. He got promoted to uh, Captain in uh, 82. 82, yeah. I went to the 15th Division covering. But I wasn't a Brooklyn man. They they didn't, uh, didn't take kindly to strangers. They didn't take kindly to my <clears throat> demeanor in Brooklyn too well. Although I knew all them guys, I still they I couldn't get a company for shit. I, I wasn't in their uh, in their Quick. loop, you know. You need to be in a circle, a circle of trust. They knew yeah, me, a circle but they of trust. Know, yeah, right. <laughs> so uh, I spent a lot of time in 283 engine because the captain there died, so I was covering there for a while. And uh, was Sarno was there? there, Bobby huh? Sarno? You remember Bobby Sarno? Was he I there? I do remember that name, but I don't remember. Good looking I Italian remember, fella. And I don't remember <laughs> for sure. Italian. I got two guys out of that company to rescue four, though. When I became captain, I liked. I got Mike Loftus and uh, and O'Gara. Mike O'Gara. It's good to but, pilfer. Um, one time I was when I went one of the problems when I went they were like we when I was in the Bronx we you know you had drill at seven thirty every night and that stuff 
And we never drilled in the Bronx because we were, we weren't there, you know, you were always out, you know, so I wasn't, we didn't have that, that built into us to have a drill. So I go to 332 engine one night and it's snowing. Snow. And I'm sitting in the office twiddling my thumbs and they call me down. I said, you got to drill. It's time to drill. Time to drill. I said, what? You know, like, what the hell? What do you mean drill? And they said, it's time to drill. And I'm saying, oh, crap. What am I going to drill with? I know. I, I, you know. I'm not even thinking about that. I'd have, I, my mind was sort of blank. But we, they had a female. There. She was just there. She just came there. I, I don't remember her name. So, I, uh, they're <laughs> futzing around in the kitchen and everything. And they, 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 they want to drill. They want to drill. So, I said, uh, you guys know how to make Irish soda bread? And they said, no, no, no. <laughs> but in 27 truck, we had a famous Irish soda bread recipe. We used to make it all the time. So I said, you don't know how to make <clears throat> Irish soda bread? You know, there's a couple of Irish guys there. No, no, no. You like it? Oh, yeah, we love it. Yeah. I said, well, tonight's drill is Irish soda bread. <laughs> and I said, and I got, I got all this stuff. I, I told them what to get and everything. And I made them each make a loaf of Irish soda bread. So they baked it and everything and then come out, it'll come out terrific and everything. So that was my drill for them and they loved it. That was great. <laughs> Where do I find that? Huh? Yeah, yeah, it's in the manual. It's in the manual. I think it's in the manual where you take your name off your uniform too when you're coming into port. It's in that same on that same page, right? Yeah. <clears throat> I, I'm in the two eighty three engine and it's annual inspection, right? That firehouse is huge. You ever see that fifth division? Fifth yeah, yeah, yeah. Division Big firehouse. four bays. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they had an ambulance in there. They had everything. In the there. squad in there at one time. Yeah. Well, the only person in there now was two eighty three in a division. Mm -hmm. So just the day before the, the inspection, I go on building inspection. There's nothing to inspect. They're, they're all vacant buildings. I walk into a vacant liquor store and there was a like a. A counter or something, and I find like a 357 Magnum pistol, fake, fake 357 Magnum pistol, but it was as real looking as could be. So I, I just took it with me, and I went back to quarters and I put it in the captain's box on the desk. The next day, we're having the annual inspection. So I don't, I mean, the chief is in quarters. I don't, I'm not worried about this at all, you know. Yeah, there's the yell over here. I like that part. So, and the guys had just painted the firehouse, the whole inside of the firehouse with their own money because to tribute the captain who died, he wanted to do that. So they did it. They did it on their own, paid everything and everything. So I'm figuring this deputy's going to, you know, give us a, a wash, right? You know? Yeah. So, so I, uh, so <laughs> I, I said to go that way. Mikey, Mikey Loftus, who's the MPO, <laughs> so good here. like the senior guy, and I says, Mikey, just tell me where the roof is. I didn't know what, even know where the roof was. I says, tell me where the roof is, because these guys usually like to go to the roof. And he says, ah, they never go to the roof. Don't worry about it. So I didn't know where the roof was, right? So the chief says, okay. He comes down with his clipboard and everything. And he's, all right, Cap, let's go to the roof. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Oh. I said, the roof? That's uh, even money. Uh, oh, hold it, hold it. <laughs> uh, Mike, come here. We, we got to go to the roof. So the roof was a straight run ladder up there and I had a hatch. So I climb up on the roof and I damn near dropped dead. I swear to God. There was sumac trees growing out of the roof about eight <laughs> feet high. There was beer cans. Oh my God. The beer cans. Oh. And there was all these, these uh, uh, air conditioning uh, cans that they used to charge air conditioners. The Freon. Uh, Freon, oh, Freon cans. Freon cans uh. or something. There was 10 or 15 of them laying on the roof. The roof was a total wreck. And I looked at it and I said, holy shit. Oh, my you know? God. And so the, the deputy looks at me and he says, watch this. And I says, chief, I says, we can't keep this thing clean. He says, that subway station is right there. All I do is throw beer cans. <laughs> all I do is throw yeah, beer see beer how fast he is. Fucking all quick. I do is throw beer cans on the roof. I said, and those things, are, those cans are from uh, the shops the you know that they, they come over here and they, they put them here so those cans are from the shops and i says those trees i said they're the men's marijuana plants <laughs> <laughs> so, 
<laughs> so he went, uh, all right, let's go downstairs. <laughs> <laughs> let's get the hell out of here. Uh, yeah. As long as you have an answer, right, Cap? That's really oh, the yeah, most important yeah. thing. So this guy, this guy, he's, he's going over everything, everything, tooth and nail. I'm going crazy, right? So finally we get finished. And after, after an annual inspection, you usually go in the kitchen and have cake, cake and coffee, and you know. So, but he, he goes... In a, in a normal company, in a place where there was uh, not uh, where there was occupied buildings, you had building cards and everything. So he says he wants to see my A forty two cards. And the A forty two cards list every building in a district when they were inspected, the last time they inspected, the number of violations, blah blah blah, the whole history. So I uh, I get the A forty two cards out and I show them to him, and there's it's nothing on them. It's like they're empty. <laughs> and he says, what the hell is this? And I says, I said, I, I looked and I, and I saw my box with the gun in it, right? And he starts harassing me about these 822 cards. I reached in, I took the gun out, I said, that's enough, chief. You know, and it looked real. And he almost shit his pants. <laughs> <laughs> and he says, I guess it's time for coffee. I says, you're right. <laughs> I should have had that we in my mailbox. <laughs> wow. And he passed us, too. I don't know how the hell he passed us. Yeah. <laughs> you're muted, Coops. Oh, my God. No, I know how but, he passed you. He was scared for his life. That's how he passed you. Yeah. He might have thought it was real. I don't know. It looked <laughs> real. All right, so how uh, how do you get the spot? Do you cover it around? How do you wind up over in – well, it wasn't sock back then, right? It was uh, – mm-hmm. how, how do you wind up in Rescue 4? It was Rescue Services. Right. Yeah, so I was in 283, and I, I was going to get that spot if I hung out there long enough. But uh, I had um, serious problems at home. Uh, my wa- I had six kids, and my wife took a hike. And left me oh, with just six shit. kids, you know. So I'm working, and I got six kids at home. I had five girls; they were all young, teen, preteens, and teens. And uh, I, I was, I was, I was struggling, you know, to keep my family together and keep them straight and keep them out of trouble and everything. So I knew Sal Sansoni was in charge of the uh, Bureau of Training, and he says, "Can I help you out?" He says, "I will give you a day job over here. At least you'll be home at night," you know. So I said, uh, okay, uh, I'll try that. So I went to the division of training, put me in charge of uh, chauffeur school. Mm, and uh, I lasted about three weeks and I hated it. I was just freaked, drove me out of my mind. I couldn't do it. And it was worse. It was worse than, than before at home, the way the hours were and everything. It wasn't good. So I went to him and I said, Sal, I can't, I can't do this. I got to go back to the field. He says, well, tell me where you want to go. I said, put me in the 14th Division. That way my commute won't be that far. Anyhow, it's Queens. So I, I, I went to the 14th Division, and he put me in 144 truck immediately because that captain got sick, and he was never coming back. So I stayed there for about – I was going to get that spot too. I stayed there for about nine months or something. And uh, my my pal was Ray Brown, who was in charge of um, – Rescue Services at the time. That was the precursor to SOC. They called it Rescue Services. And so he was running Rescue Services and he was, he, um, you know, they, they had hazmat. They were trying to get a hazmat company because Rescue 4 had the hazmat and they were just transferring all that stuff over to the real right, hazmat, 84, the new hazmat right. company and that stuff. Yep. And so it happened that um, uh, Rescue 1 had O'Flaherty, Rescue 2 had Downey. Rescue 3 had Ryan, Rescue 4 had uh, Meehan, and Rescue 5 had Driscoll. Five Irish captains, right? So there were some Colombian guys that were a little miffed at this shit, you know? And they knew that, that Meehan was getting promoted to battalion chief, and they insisted that they get an Italian in, uh, in Rescue 4. They want an Italian in there. And all these Colombian guys were all you know, they're all fighting over it and everybody and, you know, everybody's coming out of the woodwork and everything. And Ray Brown is telling, I don't even know this, right? Ray Brown is starting to tell, he's telling me this, you know, he's sitting there, he says, oh, they drive me crazy. I don't know what to do. He says, I don't know who to get. 
I can't find anybody that I, I, I think should have it that's that's halfway decent and everything. And he says, and then plus the uh, the Emerald Society is going crazy. They don't want to give up, you know, their spot. They want to have, they want to keep the Irish in there and everything. And I said, I thought about it. And I says, you know, Ray, you know, I'm a member of the Columbia Society. But I'm also a member of the Emerald Society. <laughs> I says, I'm three quarters Irish. My mother's name is Shannon. My grandmother was Shannon. Uh, my other grandma was Egan. The other one was white. You know, I, I was three quarters Irish. I says, I'm a member of both societies. Put me in there and let them fight it out after I get it. And they can't say nothing. They can't say you didn't put an Italian in there. You put a Colombian in there. And the other guy says, you can't, you, you, you didn't put a, an Emerald right. guy in there. I mean, I'm in there. So, so he says, oh, he goes, oh. So he took it down to the chief of the department, or whatever his name was, the guy from Massapequa was a good guy. And he, he, he run it up in front of them. And uh, so they interviewed me, you know, and they said, well, you got a reputation as a party guy. I don't know. I don't know where I got that reputation. I really don't. But I, I don't know where they got that. But I says, well, you know, I can't I can't I can't answer it, you know. And they says, well, we have one lieutenant there that's a problem. Uh, and uh, his name is John Dillon. And if you if you <laughs> if you, um, if, you if you think you can handle him and straighten his ass out, we'll give you the company. I said, oh, sure. I said, I won't have any problem with John Dillon. I won't have any problem with <laughs> Little did he know that John was one of my best friends. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Dillon, I'll take care I, of him. I, 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 I used out. to hang around with him and his, and his cousins and all that stuff. Duke, so, I'm going to get him a helmet. That's what I'm going to get him. Yeah, so, dude, so I go, I call, they, they, they give me the company, you know. So I go to Duke. I says, Duke, I says, listen to the story so he he had a big kick out of it and he's don't worry he says i ain't gonna he says, i ain't gonna do anything to screw you up and he didn't but it didn't make any difference because the duke had so much weight that they couldn't hurt him if they wanted to the fire commissioner couldn't even hurt him he had so much weight so he did what he wanted anyhow then i got the company and what year was that cap 85. 85. yeah so and I stayed it on 91. Was it a big change for you? You know, coming in as uh, instead of first two company, now you're coming in as a rescue? Well, it was different, you know. I mean, it, it was, uh, I liked it because it was, there was no, uh, you didn't have hydrants, you didn't have buildings, you know, you didn't have any of that crap. And you had a lot of, we had a lot of, a lot of nice tools that you could, you know, you could have fun with, you know, and do things with. And, and I started drilling with them guys. We went out, we used to, we had a boat. We used to go out in a boat, go in the East River. We'd go to the Rockaways and go out in the ocean, go out to Fort Totten and drive around, you know. We, we did that. And, you know, we'd go down to the railroad yards. We'd go into ships, go into the subway tunnels. Go, the airports, we had JFK and LaGuardia airports, the two biggest airports around. Yeah. And we'd go over to those places. We got to learn them places good, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you think about how big... The area is right you can go to astoria and then you can go to rockaway right when you think right, about yeah how yeah. how crazy it could be a two-hour ride right yeah and, and plus where it's located you could be in the bronx in 10 minutes you could be in Manhattan yeah yeah in it is minutes, perfectly and you could be in yeah. brooklyn in 10 minutes yeah so anytime one of them rescues was doing something and something happened we were there yeah you could go to I mean, 59th we street bridge right away yeah, right? we were there all the time in the different boroughs you know yeah. When you were, when you were in those other companies, Cap, did you ever have any problems? You know, with Pardon the uh, when you were in the other companies, like twenty seven and and before that, twenty six. Did you ever have any problems with the rescues? You know, uh, we had problems with rescue one when I was in eighteen because mm -hmm. there was two couple of guys there that were uh, nasty guys. You know, they I, I don't want to say their names. But I don't know. You know, I don't say. I don't think I should. But the two in particular that caused a lot of grief, you know. But basically, a lot of them were good because we sent guys there. We sent, uh, we got Eddie Toop went there from 18 Truck. He was up there a week and he got killed up there in Rescue oh, One. He got killed on Memorial Day when we were having memorial services. And, and the uh, ice house in, in uh, Greenwich Village, I don't know if you know about that fire, but uh, it was a 14 story ice house along the West Side Highway, and he was cutting the roof. And what they did up on the roof was they had had a skylight there 
and they took the skylight out and they just laid plywood over the shaft. It's a 14 story shaft. Mm. And it, but they never put any cross beams, they never supported it. So he just happened to oh. cut. Oh, and shit. when he cut, the, the thing flapped and he, he went down and it flapped back up and they didn't know where he, they didn't even realize he was he was gone. And, and as he fell down, the uh, K twelve saw cut his cut his leg off as he was he was gonna die anyhow, but on the way down he cut his leg off. Yes. And then he got killed. And then we were up at the uh, Fireman's Memorial up in uh, Riverside Drive wow. and uh, doing a ceremony and th and then when we got the word that Eddie got killed. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah, October 17th, 70, 71 or something. Hmm. Yeah. So, but for the most part, you got along with the rescues, right? Yeah. Rescue 3, we got along great. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I never, we never dealt with Rescue 2 as, as a, you know, in them other companies. I dealt mm. with him when I was in in four because I was opposite Downey group wise, and uh, I um, I I got well, and he, he was out a lot. He, he he got hurt. He got sick. He had operations. So I would always work over there overtime. So I knew them guys too. They were pretty. They they had a bad rep, but the guys I worked with seemed to be good. There was a couple of. Two or three troublemakers there too when I was working, there. but I don't want to mention their names. Those right? troublemakers everywhere. Those, those troublemakers. Yeah. Those sons yeah. of bitches. They were, they were of bitches. A lot of, lot of, was Milner a, was Milner a troublemaker? No, Milner was a sweetheart. He was. He was a nineteen truck. I knew him because I was in twenty seven. I know him hmm. down there. Oh, I'll tell you a story about Milner. This is a great story. Um, we get special call to the Bronx for a building collapse, a gas explosion, four-story building collapses, right? You get up there, it's a guy buried in the rubble. Rescue tree goes down the cellar because they can sort of see him up and they can hear him yelling. So they tell him, all right, they're gonna dig from the bottom up and we start digging from the bottom down, right? We had a lot further to go, but they had to be more careful because they were afraid the, the building was collapse into the cellar. So we dug this great big hole. It took us hours to get to this guy. We get to him. Now we're down maybe an eight or 10 foot hole and everything is shifting. It's really, it's hairy, you know, to say the least. And I got like, uh, let me see, I had probably three guys down in the hole and uh, Milner was one of them. Mikey Loftus was one. Norman Sabisi was the other. And there, and uh, there might have been another guy, and maybe Billy Billups might have been there. I got them in the hole, and they're, they're shoring stuff up, and they're cutting and shoring and cutting and shoring. It took a real, real long time. So we get this guy pretty much uncovered, but we still can't get him out. Now, they didn't have EMS in the fire department then, but they had EMS, city EMS people. And they, they're they pissing and moaning that, that we're not letting them do anything with this victim. So anyhow, whoever was running the show for the fire department, some assistant chief or something, relents, and they're going to put uh, an EMS worker down into the uh, into the pit. We'll take him down and give the guy a shot. I know it's a painkiller or what kind of shot they're going to give him. So they pick a girl, EMS girl. And I, you know, we take her over to the edge and she looks down and, and it's scary. I mean, it was scary. So she starts to, you know, get very, very nervous and all that stuff. So we take it, get it down, get it way down in a hole. Now we're eight or 10 feet down in, in this rubble. And Milner's there. She takes the needle. And instead of sticking the victim. No trapped, way. She sticks Milner in the thigh <laughs> and gives him the shot. <laughs> 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 Yes. <laughs> you gotta ask him about that. <laughs> you can't even make that <laughs> up. <laughs> so well, well, I've never heard him so much. You dick. I, I don't think I've ever heard him say that, Cap. Yeah. No, no he kept that shit yeah. quiet, dude. He kept yeah, that shit quiet. Eighty-five or something. She shot him right in the with the big old freaking syringe right in his his leg. Oh my god, that yeah. is freaking. Who yeah. else is in the chat here? I saw Richie Euler was in the chat. Yeah, yeah. Richie. Richie. Uh, Richie came from 111, and I, uh, I I almost didn't let him stay because he kept screwing up. 
you know, <laughs> and but he had a lot of uh, he had a lot of good things that people said good things about him, and I got to like him, and uh, we're, we're very good friends now, and I I love him now to this day and his mm. wife, wonderful people. Mike but, Wilder uh, wants to know who sh who shot the Reverend. Oh God, no, I, <laughs> I, I don't know if I could. Uh, I shot the shit. <laughs> we I had this guy. Reverend. This guy. This guy wants to come. He wants to come, and he's. I and I. I he was in the hazmat, and uh, he came, all of a sudden he shows up, working with an onion skin. And I said, "What the hell is this? Nobody said nothing to me about this." <clears throat> I called up downtown and I sent them back. I said, "Get this guy out of here. I don't even know who he is. You know, I don't want him." So. Um, so so I said, let him go through channels and come the right way and all that shit. So I don't know, six or eight months later, this he had a lot of weight, this guy too. I don't know who it was, but he shows up. And then he was a fire buff, but he didn't buff New York fire department. He buffed the Boston fire department. He mm. loved the Boston fire department. He got tools from the Boston fire department. He used to carry Boston rakes, you know, and stuff like that. But anyhow. He was a Nassau County cop, and he's oh, there's your patrol. answer right there. <laughs> <laughs> he's he's on patrol in Mineola, right? And they get a radio call that some black guy held up people with a gun at the Hicksville train station and jumped on a train station, right? And the train is heading towards Mineola, right? So in comes the train to the Mineola train station. He hops on. And he sees a black guy back there and he goes, boom, and he shoots him. <laughs> what? And the guy was a reverend reading the Bible. The oh, Bible my Bible. God. <laughs> and he got on this job? Well, he ended up in the fire department. I don't know what happened. But oh, my he shot, he God. He shot the reverend. He shot the reverend. Who shot the Reverend Milner? Yeah. Who shot the uh, Reverend? Did he kill him? I hate. No, he didn't kill him. He didn't kill him. Thank God he didn't kill him. <laughs> My Reverend. goodness gracious. He, Just, he wow. does a graze wound. It was a graze wound. You can shoot the Reverend. Oh, still oh Ray Strong oh. was in the chat before. Yeah. yeah. Big oh, Ray, Ray Strong. Strong. Big Ray Strong. I'll tell you a story about good old Ray. He comes to see me. He must have come to Rescue 4. He comes in the office door. Do you ever see Ray Strong? Oh, I know very, very well. Oh, Big monster guy, right? Fits so the he's name. Young, he's, he's very young. He's big. He fills the whole door. I look, I'm sitting at the desk. I'm looking at this guy. I said, holy shit. And he's telling me, oh, I'm this, I'm that, and I'm a volunteer fighter, blah, 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 but I think it got to bulk up a little bit before we let you. <laughs> I mean, That's Ray, right? That's a big No, no. Oh, no. Okay. Was, oh, yeah. McGuire, my bad. My bad. No, I'm no. trying to be good. He, yeah. he was he was big and he, he was like uh, the, the, a wrestler. The he's a monster. Was Arnold Schwarzenegger. He, he looks like bad. Arnold. Yeah, he's big. Yeah, and I told him, I said, no, nah, no, nah, you got to bulk up a little better. And you're not, you're not <laughs> yeah, you got to put a few pounds on, bro. So he comes, he comes in about six or eight months and the guy is twice as big as he was. I was holy shit. I was like, I gotta take this guy. He's gonna kill me if I don't take him. He, he's probably he's a one eleven guy. One eleven guy. He, yeah, he went to he went back to one eleven. He, he stayed there for a while. Went to one eleven and then came back as a lieutenant to rescue. Four. Rescue four. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm very. Yeah, he's a great guy. I like Ray. He lives by me in in Rocky Point. Sweetheart, he's right here Sweet. where I live. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lives up Sweetheart. the block. Who else did I saw? I saw, I don't really know exactly what he said because I don't see it, but Chief Kill Duff was in there and he said, oh. you know, for an old guy, you remember a lot. You're pretty sharp. Eddie Kill I grew up with his father a little bit. I know his old man from Flushing and he hangs out with my brother, Eddie. So, um, you know, he and Ed are like this. You are? <laughs> Yeah, you, Louis and Ed are like this. I call him I call, Ed him, I call him Chief Kilduff. Louis calls him Ed. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I, you know, I didn't really know Eddie too much in, until later. And uh, after I got out of the job, I sort of got to know him better. And now I know him very well. We play golf in the same uh, golf uh, league and everything. I see him every week. So yeah, he's a good, roof. good man. A golfer, he, Ruff. Golf? Huh? I was going to say that. Ruffy's a big golfer. Yes. Who is? I play. I play a lot of guy. Golf. This this guy right up here. Oh, you? 
Yeah, yeah Lewis. This guy right I up here. I got a higher mm-hmm. handicap than you. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was going to say. I was gonna well, ask. he's good. Fr- uh, we're good friends, so he's got a really high handicap. That would yeah. be me. Called Coobs. Yeah. That's me. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, last year this time, I weighed 148 pounds. So I, I couldn't I couldn't even swing a golf club, but I tried. I tried. I finally got back on my feet. I had a few struggles in the last two, three years. Well, I'm glad you I got doing COVID. Better now. I spent 30 days in the hospital and COVID. And since I was 80 years old, they said, screw this guy. And they put me in the corner to croak. But I fooled them. <laughs> you know? I'll show you. So yeah, so I didn't croak on him. So that then oh, that was in t- that was I spent the whole first month of t- 2021 in the hospital. Wow. Then I then in uh, June I got uh, pneumonia. I spent another eight days in the hospital. Then in October I got heart failure and I spent another eight or ten days in the hospital. Then uh, then I went to Florida. And I fat, promptly fell and broke my femur, and I spent four months on my back oh, without shit. walking. Holy shit. Yeah, so then I went down to 148 pounds. I was 230 when I started, and I went what down you, to 148. What are you back up to now? I'm about, about 185, 190. All right. So I'm getting some strength back. The kids live close by, North. Cap? Pardon me? Your kids live close by? Yeah, yeah. I got them around. Yeah. I got a I picture got a of him of and his son. Here. He's that that guy's down in Carolina, but he comes up all the time. He's in a Green Greenville, South Carolina. Nice. He's on he's a job. A, um, pardon me. He's a cop or fireman. No, no, he, no. He's a national educator. He's a national education consultant. Oh, all right. He travels all over the country. Does a lot of Indian reservations and travels all over. Does he did a lot in New York, Long Island, upstate. Now he's out in the Dakotas, down in Arizona and New Mexico, and he straightens out school districts. Oh, all right. You know, that's what he does. Is he still he a volunteer? Not now. No, no. not down there. No. He didn't take the but bed seats out of a, he, of, a, of a car and drive across the country, did he? <laughs> no, he did not. No. <laughs> but he, went, he, he was like a principal in, in, in uh, um, Kings Park Junior High School. And he quit that job, and he went down to Tucson and became a um, superintendent, assistant superintendent of schools. And it, and, it, and the district down there was just they was just starting to build Tucson big. It's four hundred square mile school district. That's huge, you know. So he that's a huge. He thing. got down there and he built seven high schools as as a uh, as an administrator. He built seven high schools. And he, um, he, he, he wrote some books and he got noticed by these national companies. So they hired him. And now he goes and he works for them. He goes around, and does stuff for them. But he, so that's why I can see him often because he's up, he's up here. You yeah. got grand chitlins too? I got 12. 12. Woo, 12. 12. Six yeah. kids, 12. Before, before we get too far, I wanted to ask you this. I forgot. Uh, you had uh, Chief Lafamina, Freddie Lafamina. Oh, Freddie was a good guy. Freddie, yeah, man, he's a sweetheart. We played golf. I, I got to find out if he shot me the short game when I, when he was playing. I played him a match and he couldn't he couldn't chip or uh, or pitch worth the shit. And he was, but he could hit the ball good. But he was really failed. Cap, you know, in the you need the game. short game, Cap. It's all in the short game. Well, he he failed in it, and I told I gave him a few hints. And I said, you got to go get lessons, man, because you could be a good damn golfer. And he said that he had a friend who was a pro that was going to teach him. So I, I, I haven't asked him. I see him, but I haven't asked him if he took got advantage a guy. of that. Mm. But he's a good, good man. I loved him. He was a great fireman down there when, when uh, he was covering four and that stuff. Mm. And he what did about very the, well uh, in his career. Yeah, what about the triple well. Lindy on the beluga boat? Oh. <laughs> oh, how do you hear about that? <laughs> <laughs> we a little birdie, little birdies, Cap. You saw that picture of uh, you saw that picture of Quick on the back of the boat, right? Which one? With, with his shaved. He, yeah, yeah, oh, oh, Quick. Yeah, yeah, I got that one. Well, that, that the Beluga boat belonged. Yeah, that's it. That that boat belonged to the Hegland brothers, the two brothers that you saw yeah. in these other pictures. Yeah, and they, Paul, call it the Belu- they call it the Beluga. 
So every year on my birthday, we'd have a birthday party on a beluga boat, and I would do the triple Lindy off the the top of the boat, right? I, I you know, like Rodney Dangerfield in the in yeah, the yeah, movie. yeah. So that was famous. But I always did it naked, you know. What? <laughs> that part out. You left that part out. Oh, then there's that. So, so, uh, so this 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 uh, this day, my fiftieth birthday was my fiftieth birthday. We we're all out there, and you know, there was this guy in Rescue Four, Bobby Leone. We call him the Fonz or Ashki Bashki. And then he was uh, he was on the top roof, the roof of the boat, with suntan oil. And he was like in a speedo, and he. <laughs> oh no! No, he 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 was doing it. He was doing it naked, and now. <laughs> oh, oh man! Uh oh, man! He did so good. Let's see. It's going to be tough to get him get back, back. I think. Ah, uh, yeah. We'll see. Right, before he gets back, guys, let's do the uh, the last uh, spot we got. FRCE. Oh. Yeah. Dude, that guy can remember everything, man. It's crazy how they I do, remember, right? I swear to you, I don't remember what I had for breakfast this morning. This guy's telling me, oh, look, he's back. No, okay. oh, it's Mike. It's not him. No. All <laughs> right, check it off. Hi. All right, you ready to go? Yeah, yeah. good. Do it, Here we go. The First Responder Center for Excellence is a not-for-profit organization dedicated to protecting the lives and livelihoods of first responders. Their education and research initiatives aim to bring greater awareness and understanding the challenges to the health, safety, and well-being of firefighters, EMS personnel, and other first responders, too. They are an affiliate of the National Fallen Firefighter Foundation. Excellent. All right, we have a whole bunch of new uh, tips, so here's one of them. Are you a firefighter or first responder aiming to strengthen your well-being and resilience amid high-stress situations? Look no further than FRCE Stress God, you got Aid Online course, especially designed for firefighters. It's available on demand, and it's the best of all. It's free of charge. Free, free, free. Curbside Matter Stress First Aid is a comprehensive program equipped, equipping you with vital skills to support fellow fire, firefighters and first responders and loved ones during and after on-scene emergencies. This groundbreaking program offers practical techniques to reduce stress, improve mental health, and optimize your performance on and off the scene. Enroll now and take the first step towards a healthier and more empowered you. Visit firstresponderscenter.org to enroll. Firstresponderscenter.org to enroll. All right. All right, Cap, you're back, baby. All right, finish the beluga here. We got (laughs) – so you're naked. The other guy's oiling up with a Speedo on. (laughs) Can you hear us? No, I don't hear it. There's something wrong. I don't get. I don't know where it's what it could be. Can you hear us? One, two. I got the pictures, and I don't hear your voice. Uh Is he muted? No, No. I don't think so. And you're frozen. Your pictures are frozen. That's on your end. That's on his end. Yeah, he's not muted or anything. He's good. You know what, guys? Have him go up, put him out, and then uh, we'll bring him back in. We'll try and bring him back in. Maybe something's going on. All right. You want to give him a quick call, and I get something. Yeah, I'll call him. Yeah. Yep, 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 yep. So check out that first responder center.org. You know what? While uh briefing, bro. We can run our aid if you want to. We can run our aid if you want to take the 50 seconds and Yeah, that way all we have to do is the old school tip of the day from El Capitan. Okay, let's run our ad. I'll tell you what. All right, guys. We're gonna go ahead and uh if you want to get some salty apparel, this is how to do so. If you're looking for a gift for that special firefighter in your life, then head on over to GettingSaltyApparel.com. Yes, GettingSaltyApparel.com. What do we have? Well, we carry hand-drawn original t-shirts, glassware such as mugs, shot glasses, pint glasses, engraved Arctic cooler cups, and much, much more. There's also a full line of firefighter tool bottle openers like Halligan's, Nozzles, and wine bottle opener accesses too. And if you're a cigar smoker, congratulations! We have partner saw cigar cutters and humidors. Think we're done? Far from it. We got toiletry, gear bags, koozies, a full line of hats, decals, sweatshirts, and once again, so much more. 
We can also personalize most of these products. And if you want discounts, hey, you've come to the right place. We got discounts on large orders, for promotion dinners, weddings, as well as installation dinners. Just head on over to GettingSaltyApparel.com. And um, big, uh, oh, yeah, brain no. big Bill. Big Bill, Jamie, uh, we'll be down there with them in their booth. One Source, we'll play the One Source commercial again. Uh, so look us up down there. And for those of guys who are coming down on 9-11, we appreciate it. Well, remember, to don't forget to tell me about the frictional coefficient, and uh, Gonzo will buy you a free round of drinks. <laughs> I will. You know what, Gonzo, do me one more favor. Do you have the uh, One Source ad that Mike made? ready to go. You ready? Just play it for that. Right, yeah. Here. Here we yeah. go. We're going to the booth with them. Okay. Equip your fire and rescue emergency response personnel with the equipment they need to save lives and keep themselves as protected as possible while in harm's way with safety equipment from One Source Fire Rescue. Our comprehensive supply company provides the life-saving implements emergency responders need to be prepared for any situation. With dependable quality products by reputable companies such as Traeger, Viking Life Saving Equipment, Fire Hooks, Crew Boss, Kuriyama Fire Hose and Nozzles, Phoenix Technology, Helmets, Vanguard Gloves, Tempest Fans, Ready Rack, Black Diamond Boots, and much more. Our quality products are competitively priced to meet your budget criteria. One Source was established in 2012 and continues to strive to provide not only the best products on the market, but customer service. One Source has been and continues to be committed to meeting all new and demanding challenges in the firefighting industry with the highest quality and the most dependable products. Excellent. We'll be down there in Jersey with them. And Ruffy and I will be out in Ohio at the Firehouse Magazine at the end of September sometime. And that's it. All right, guys. Do you, uh, Lou, do you guys have any ground rules for anybody that shows up to uh, new guests that come to the Firehouse? Yeah, just, I don't be know if you're open that just be respectful. If you want to buy a shirt, wait till the end. Don't start asking guys like to buy a squad yeah, shirt or something like that. Like, uh, point, obviously, yeah. use your brain. Yes. Yeah. Just be respectful. Kind of just mill around in the back, and uh, that's it. Pay your respects, and then we go up to uh, the watering hole that we burnt down once before. Uh, O'Neill's <laughs> fire, and uh, tell me about the friction coefficient, and that's it. All right, Ruff. I'll see you uh, Monday. Unless you come into my house this weekend, let me know. Ten four. Gonzo, I'll see you tomorrow as I pick your stinky ass up from the airport. Stinky, man. I'll, I'll, I'll put some good cologne on for All right, you. Thank you. <laughs> All right, guys. Until then, stay low and go. All right, everybody. We'll see you at the big one. All right, everyone. See you at the top floor and have a good night. Stay safe.